heard of a true story about a farmer who lived in the Midwest who supposedly hated all things regarding religion. Every time a car with a Christian family drove by his farm, he would always wave the, his fist at them and poke fun at them. In a particular season, he had the finest crops ever out of all the farms nearby. Because of this achievement and because of his gloating, he posted an ad in the newspaper in the following week stating, Faith in God must not mean much if someone like me can prosper. To which the church posted an ad the next day replying, God doesn't always settle accounts in October. Sometimes when we hear stories like this, we're thinking, why do the evil people prosper? We've lived in a lot of different societies in which we're with people and we're even in cities that are so wicked that we ask ourselves, what does God think about all this? Is God ever going to judge the wickedness of the city? Cities like, you name it, it could be West Hollywood, San Francisco, New York City, Miami, all this wickedness going on in all the idolatry, all the sexual immorality, all the drug use, all the murders. Why isn't God doing anything? Is he supporting these things? Does he hate these things? What is the deal, Lord? We know that God is showing amazing grace in a lot of these lands because he hasn't burned them down into a crisp yet. But in the passage that we're going to look at today, we see how God indeed cares about what is going on in the cities and that because he's a righteous judge, he is going to bring judgment down upon the guilty someday. That all of our choices have consequences. Good is rewarded and evil is punished. And because God is a good God, he will punish evil. And he makes an example out of one particular, one specific city, Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, which is the topic here tonight. In this passage, we see how God, a holy God, judges sin and iniquity. But at the same time, we see how the righteousness of God is so pure and good that he doesn't just sweep the righteous believers along with the guilty, but that he is able to separate them so that the righteous do not suffer in the same fate as the wicked unbelievers. And the reason why God shows us this incident of him destroying Sodom and Gomorrah is for three different reasons. Number one, he does it to show what he thinks about particular sins and what he plans to do about it someday. Number two is to set an example for Abraham's children so that Abraham's children will not follow in the evil example of those cities. And then number three is to show the general wickedness of mankind so that they can see a need for a savior. And at the same time, when we see God's righteousness in judgment, like I said, we see his righteousness in delivering the saints so that they will not get swept up in the same judgment. So these two chapters that we're going to look at tonight testify to the righteousness of God as seen both in his commitment to condemn the wicked and also to preserve the righteous. And in the first point we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at the righteous assessment of God, the righteous analyzation, the righteous assessment of God. And if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 18. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. And this is the word of God. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcome of so- the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. While Abraham was still standing before the Lord, Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. He spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And God said, I will not do it on account of the forty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And God said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And God said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. So we're going to stop right there. We're going to look at what we just read. So we see how in this, it starts out with Abraham walking with the three to walk off with them. Last week, I talked about how God demonstrated the power of his faithfulness, his trustworthiness to deliver on the promises, the Abrahamic covenant promises, and how the three visited Abraham last week. So now it's the end when he's about to walk off with them and they approach Sodom and Gomorrah. And when this happens, it says the first thing that the Lord does is that he thinks within himself. He thinks within himself whether he should reveal to Abraham what he's about to do in this wicked city. And there are two possible reasons for why God was thinking this in his head. Number one is he has to explain to Abram why one country was suddenly being removed from this plan of Israel going out and blessing all the Gentile nations of the earth. And then number two, it was possibly to show Abraham what it means to teach the righteousness and justice of God towards his future generation. So he indeed told Abraham about what he is about to do. It says right here is that the cry from Sodom testifies of its evil and the Lord responds in righteous judgment. See, it says, its cry came out to me. That's what the Lord said. If you remember this language, it was even used all the way in the beginning with Abel's blood when he was murdered by his brother Cain. The cry of justice coming out from the ground. And God took notice of that. In the same way, the outcry of injustice and perversion is coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when it came that their iniquity was so great, was so full, that God decided at that moment that it was time to execute judgment. And it says here that the Lord 
goes down to see for himself whether it is true or not. And when he goes down to see, this is also reminiscent of another event, the Tower of Babel incident in Genesis 11.7, when the nations were building a tower in their pride to go up to him, but yet they cannot reach God because God still has to go down to them, right? Which shows his transcendence as well as his full knowledge of everything that is going on. So God, when he says that he is going to go down to them to assess, he is going to judge rightly, as in with the fullest information. It's not that God didn't know about it, but God is trying to tell us in his word that God always judges accurately before he makes such a judgment like this. So he's not judging carelessly. It's kind of like if you're in a court of law and you're about to convict this really huge criminal and you want to sentence him to a maximum life sentence, you're going to make sure that you have all the evidence in front of you before you can really cast sentence on that guy. And in the same way, God is making sure that he has all the evidence he needs in order to show that this city, this wicked city, is prime for judgment. And then when Abraham hears this, he is disturbed. He's not disturbed because he cares so much about these people in Sodom, but he's thinking about one person in particular. That is his nephew, Abraham. No, Lot. What am I saying? Lot, not Abraham. Yeah, it is Lot and his family, of course. Yep, sometimes I can get kind of mixed up in my head. So that's what happens to preachers sometimes. <laughs> and then he's pleading with God to... Spare the city. So what he's doing right here, right now, is that he's trying to probe the righteousness of God to see how exactly, how righteous he really is. Is he really going to let the wicked go along with the righteous? Because it says right here that Lot, even though he's imperfect, and he's not quite as godly as Abraham is, but he's a righteous man. He's righteous because he has faith in Yahweh. He has been saved. And we know that God is always faithful to those whom he has elected and saved. That is why they go to this back and forth thing, which happens about six times, starting from 50 and then going all the way down to 10. Now that's incredible because Sodom and Gomorrah must have had at least thousands of people living in these cities. So 50 is really a small number. And then when he goes down and down, and down, and down, and down. We really see the justice of God on display, His righteousness, that He says that even if there are only 10 people here, I will spare the city. I will not destroy the city because of these 10 people. Just a small percentage of the whole city that is shielding the city from judgment. That is incredible. And that is showing the depth of God's mercy right here. Now, when he talks about righteous, what is, a, what is a righteous person? Because we've heard that term used in the Old Testament, like with Job and then with people like Zechariah, how they were righteous people. What does it mean that they're righteous? Well, number one, what it does not mean is that they're good people based on their own morality. It doesn't mean that, saying, they're, oh, they're just good people. When the Bible talks about righteousness, it talks about a person who has been made righteous because of his faith in God and in his promises. That just like us Christians, that when we repent and trust in Christ for our salvation, our sins are credited to Christ and his righteousness is given to us. And the Holy Spirit works out that righteousness in fruit. So it, does, it has a legal component, but also has some practical observations as well. This is what it means, that when people in the Bible are considered righteous, that means that they are part of the covenant promises because of faith. So to be unrighteous means that you have no part in the covenant and that you have no interest in obeying God. And these people are what is called the wicked people. So Abraham does not want the righteous to suffer the same fate as the wicked. So that is why he keeps pleading till he gets down to a particular 10. 
And why is it that he stops at 10? Most likely, it's because that is the number of, a, of Lot's entire family. Because who do we have here in Lot's family? We have Lot, his wife. We have his two daughters, two sons-in-laws, two more daughters, and two sons. So that's the 10 right there. And when he says destroy, it comes from the Hebrew word sahat, which is the same word used when he was talking about, when the Lord mentioned the great flood in Genesis 6, that he is about to destroy the whole world in the flood, and then God rescues these eight righteous people. The only eight righteous people, because of their faith, he took them out, he delivered them out before his judgment came to sweep the whole world out. And in the same way, it is because of God's righteousness and his desire to save those who are his by faith, that he will rescue Lot out of that and preserve that city. And when you think about it, it's, do you really think that that's probably the reason why God is withholding judgment from so many cities around the world? Could it be because of the presence of Christians that he doesn't want to sweep the righteous along with the unrighteous that us Christians, that we're kind of shielding the cities so that they won't get destroyed. Because if you look around right now, we see cities and the way they act, it's, it has gone way beyond Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, exceedingly beyond. Sodom and Gomorrah is just like child's play compared to what some of the cities are doing right now. And the question we're thinking is, why hasn't God rained fire and brimstone upon these cities as well? You know, God's judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah, this is not meant to be prescriptive, as in like every time a city gets to Sodom and Gomorrah League that God is automatically going to rain fire and brimstone down. It is a historically conditioned event to show us something, to show us about the danger of sin, what God thinks about sin and how he will judge sin someday. And we know that there is a time in which God will judge the world again. That the next time we see God's prophetic judgment coming upon the world is during that great tribulation period, which is why in Revelation 3.10 it says that those who are faithful, they will be taken out of the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world. That God is going to rescue us like Lot so that we will not have to suffer in the same fate as those who will need to suffer during the tribulation period. And when we think about this, it should cause us to pray for the nations. And when I say pray, I don't mean just for their salvation. We should be praying for the righteous people within those cities. We should be praying that God will spare them, that God will protect them, and not sweep them in judgment if he ever did do something that we don't know about. We must be constantly interceding for these people in these cities. Because God's people are scattered everywhere. And they're probably the only reason why God is withholding Sodom and Gomorrah-like judgment upon them. So now that God has seen that he knows of the unrighteousness of Sodom and Gomorrah, he has a plan to get Lot out of there. which is the next point tonight in point number two is the righteous rescue of God, which is demonstrated. That God demonstrates his righteousness in the rescue of the righteous, of those who are saved. We're gonna, I'm going to read from 19, 1 through 22. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, No, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, 
surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let them, please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men, inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand aside. Furthermore, they said, This one came in as an alien, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in this city. Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up! Get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Then morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up! Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But Lot hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought him outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords! Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. Is it not small? that my life may be saved? He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. So in this next episode, we see how God sent his two angels to go down to examine the city before making his judgment. So they go down, and who meets them? Lot meets them at the gate. And it's almost like the way that Abraham met the angels, that he goes up to them, he's excited, and then he even invites them into his home for a meal. However, we see that he really dissuades them from staying in the square, that he wants to bring them into his home because he knows what the men of the city are like. So he really insists on bringing them into his house instead so that they don't face danger. And then the men of Sodom, it says that they came into the property of Lot. Men of all ages, from the young to the old, just showing how this perversion has spread to pretty much all the people in the city that they come in and they say to Lot that they want to meet these people to have relations with them. And when he talks about relations, it's not relations as in saying, oh, I want to meet your friend and who is your buddy right there. This word relations is the one that's even used with Adam and Eve. It's talking about sexual relations. It's talking about intercourse. So what he is saying, or what this passage is talking about is, quite bluntly, homosexuality. Homosexuality as well as rape. 
And we see Lot's hypocrisy that is exposed when he offers his daughters instead. That he knows that this sin to him is wicked and he would much rather have these men take and rape his daughters than to do this wicked thing before his guests. So we're not talking about an issue of lack of hospitality here because there were other nations, of course, at that time that showed lack of hospitality, but they weren't judged. I mean, it has to be something so serious and so abnormal for God to bring such a judgment upon this city. So we know that this is a very serious sin that it is talking about right here, the sin of homosexuality, which is one of the things that characterized this wicked city, to show that this city has become morally bankrupt. Turn with me to Jude 6, Jude 6 and 7. Jude comes after 3 John. It says here, And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We're actually going to read a pretty long one, beginning in chapter 8, or verse 18 in chapter 1. So this is Paul right here talking about what happens when men and women abandon the Lord in order to live a life of selfish, evil pleasures, when they turn away from the word of God. In verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, For their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of of the women and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do these things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. You can turn back to your passage. That is quite a serious picture, isn't it? That we see that there is a trend in which when men abandon God, they turn away from Scripture, 
They go into idolatry. And then the next step they go under is sexual immorality, fornication, pornography. And then below that, when we hit rock bottom, is when people do the unnatural and go beyond just fornication and they actually commit these acts against each other, people of the same sex. And then they're pretty much given over to all sorts of pride and evil. So what this text is saying is that when people get to this last stage, it shows that they have that society has pretty much hit rock bottom. And we're seeing that all around the world right now, not just in this country. That we are indeed a Sodom and Gomorrah-like land. And not only that, but it says that they give hearty approval to those who practice such things. And we see a lot of people giving hearty approval to people who practice sexual sins, whether it's homosexual or heterosexual sins. Now, it is a difficult subject for me to talk about, especially living in such a liberal city like this, but I want to be faithful to tell you guys and all the listeners, even online, that homosexuals are not beyond saving grace. That they can be saved as well. That they are drinking of one poison out of many sins, and of course they will be judged for their other sins as well, but they are not beyond the saving grace of God. That they can still be saved. And we must treat them like we would treat any sinners. That of course we we are going to point out their sinful nature, but we're going to share the grace of God with them so that they can be saved. Because we believe our God, He can transform sinners. That He can do that even with homosexuals. That I've seen it happen with drug dealers. I've seen it happen with alcoholics. I've seen it happen with people struggling with pornography. I've seen it happen with people who are worshiping false gods. I've seen it happen with murderers, people struggling with rage since they were little. God can do that even with people who struggle with the sin. And I just have to say that because God's gospel is sufficient for them as well. But yet at the same time, You know, sin is sin, and that's the reason why he wrote this passage was to show us that it is indeed a sin before God and something that needs to be repented of before his judgment comes. And, you know, we see this really sad picture here about, even when we look at Lot, that Lot came into the city and we know that he was saved because he still has a conscience, he still understands right and wrong. But the city has so corrupted his thinking that he's just started to make really poor choices as a believer in God. That we see this, that instead of trying to protect his daughters, that he pulls, he tries to offer his daughters instead. Trading one sin for another. That it just shows that even believers like this can really be so corrupted by the world that it causes them to compromise in some ways. And how do the men react that they don't accept the offer, but they actually turn on Lot? And they said, you who just came in here, who are you to judge me? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I mean, how many people actually say that these days in the LGBT community? It happened even back then as well. That when you confront people with their sins that they're going to confront you back and tell them that you are judging them. So what do they do? Because of their desire to carry out their sins that they break in and they take Lot in, planning to do to Lot also what he's going to do to the strangers or the people in the house. And then what happens there is something miraculous. They are blinded so that they can't see, so that Lot can escape from there. But despite their blindness, they're still like, kind of like searching for the door. I mean, I would, I would just be in shock. Like, how did I get blind in the first place? But they don't care about that. They're just like going and still looking, trying to find the victims to get their hands on. That shows that really the power that this sin had over their minds and their hearts, it was just so sad. 
So sad. And then we see the messengers tell them, tell Lot to get out. He said, they've said, pretty much we've seen enough. That's all we needed to see. The city's going to be destroyed. Now you got to get your family. You got to get them out right now. Get them out. Tell them right now. And that is what Lot does. In fact, he goes to his son and he warns him about the judgment that is to come. He says, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But Lot appeared to his sons-in-laws to be jesting, which means joking. It's kind of like saying, what? Get out of here. Yeah, right. God is going to destroy the city tomorrow. But it's, we see a sad picture of here when the word of God concerning judgment is ignored and the consequences come. That when God warns us about something, we must listen to it. And if it's really that urgent, we must act right away and not question anything. And it just shows that they, his sons-in-laws were just so in the world that they just didn't care about what God had to say. So God had to sweep them away. It says right here in verse 16, in 15, Lot was saying, or the angels were saying to Lot, take your wife and your two daughters, those who will go with you, because this city will be swept away. But in verse 16, it says, but Lot hesitated. Because the city had such an influence on him that he loved the city so much that he just couldn't let go of it. That he knew he was going to lose something. So what happens? The angel basically takes Lot by the arm and drags him out of the city. Let's go right now. And when we think about this, this is God's mercy that's on display. Because God could have easily said, oh, he's in the world. He doesn't care. Just leave him here to die. But God literally had to use the angel to drag him out. And that shows how merciful he was to the inter intercessory plea of Abraham. Yet despite the fact that even when Lot was going out, he didn't want to completely leave because Zoar was actually one of the cities that was supposed to be destroyed. Five cities total. And he says, I want to go to this city nearby. Please, Lord, not to the mountains. I'm going to get destroyed on the way there. And surprisingly, he says, okay, I'll let you go to that city. So what does that mean? That means that city was actually spared. Unbelievable, huh? So what we can learn from this is when we pray before God, there are a few things that happen. We get a yes answer, we get a no question, or we get a wait, right? And even in certain requests like this, it shows that our intercession sometimes do at times block judgment that comes upon certain cities, that he even grants these requests that are kind of trivial, but God does it. In order to accommodate people, like Lot here. And I, I need you to really see what Lot was going through because it's kind of like if he, because we know how he separated from Abraham because of the land dispute and he went into Sodom. So that's kind of like saying if you separated from your family and you moved to San Francisco, you start a new life there and you're just, you're a true believer. You indeed are, but because you're so into the culture of San Francisco. You're so into the business, the economy of San Francisco, as well as its pleasures, that it really does have a worldly influence on your mind. And what happens is that when, he, when God destroys it, he, they, Lot just couldn't let it go. And when he was going, it's kind of like saying that if God was going to destroy San Francisco, Lot was trying to negotiate with the angel saying, oh no, can I just go to Berkeley instead and just hang out there? When in fact, maybe Berkeley was supposed to be one of the cities that was supposed to be destroyed. But he was saying that he listened to Lot. He listened to him out of mercy and just left him there. That is why we can by all means live in a city, any city, of course. Every city that we go to are going to have sinful people there doing a lot of stuff. But I think the point that is trying to get here is that we should not be so attached to the world that we lose sight of God and his will in the process. 
Do you remember what John said in 1 John 2, 15, 17, when he says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away in its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So once God gets Lot out of there, then judgment finally comes. Then it's showtime. We see the next aspect of God's righteousness on display in point number three in the judgment of God, in the actual judgment of God. If you're in verse 23, follow along with me from 23 to 29. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. So we see that in the morning judgment finally came that it came upon four cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. Everything was destroyed. Everything, the population, the vegetation, everything, the culture was totally obliterated. And what was probably the greatest nuking experience ever, fire and brimstone coming out of heaven, it would have been one of the greatest things you could ever see if it was ever shown on a movie with all the special effects. That it was a scary sight right here. And God acted in agreement within his Godhead. You see over here in verse 24, it says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord. Look at that. The Lord rained on the city from the Lord. So we see an agreement in the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit concerning the appropriateness of judgment upon the city for its sins, whether it's homosexuality, rape, whatever the case is that they were in agreement in their righteousness to bring judgment upon the city. And we see a sad picture as well, that one of the people whom God purposed to take out was actually killed. That this person, Lot's wife, because she turned back. Now, this isn't just this, like just a slight glance back like this, but the word here is talking about glancing back with the intention of possibly going back. And when she did that, she was turned into a pillar of salt. And she was killed. And what's fascinating is that many years later, when Jesus was talking about saving faith, what true faith looked like, he actually quotes this incident in Luke 17, 32 to 33, when he said, Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So Lot's wife became in an example of what it's like when you have the world and you just wouldn't let it go. When you're holding on to your sins, your idols. And Christ used this as an example to show us the importance of what we need to repent of when we come to Jesus for our eternal salvation. God remembered Abraham's request that even though God destroyed the wicked, but he was faithful to deliver the saints. That even though Lot was not perfect by any means, that God still showed his mercy to preserve this saint of his. And we see a display of how God, those whom he has elected, 
despite their imperfection, will be preserved by God. I want to show you this in 2 Peter 2. Can you turn there with me? 2 Peter 2, 6 to 8. Second Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, And if he, God, condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. You can turn back to the passage. It shows that God, in his faithfulness, will preserve his saints. That there will be a wide range of Christians, some who are pretty much like Abraham, and then there are some who are a little bit more this direction, who struggle with worldliness. That is why God always talks about the importance of not serving two masters, of not living for the world, because even if we are saved, God knows that the world can have such a big influence in our thinking that it corrupts our choices and has severe consequences. That we can make so many mistakes if we are in the world. That we know, like I said before, that God's judgment will be coming upon the world again. That he is going to take the saints out when he brings this worldwide judgment upon a whole world that has gone beyond the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is that when God comes and takes us out, are we going to be like Lot? Will we be like Abraham or all the really faithful saints of the Bible and willingly go with him in the air? Or will we be just looking back and saying, Lord, I still haven't done a lot of things that I wanted to do on earth. I still didn't make this much money. I never got married. I never had kids. I never did this in my life. Is that going to be you when the Lord comes? I mean, God is going to be merciful and he's going to drag you out of there whether you like it or not. But I think right now we should really be fostering that attitude of being willing to go, even if we have immense treasures here in this world, so that we don't have to suffer in that same judgment and suffer the shame that Lot suffered. And like I said, sin, living for the world, has massive consequences that affect even Lot's future generation, which is in the last point tonight, is the aftermath. This is what I labeled it, the aftermath, the corruption of sin. I'm going to read from verse 30 to 38, which is our last section tonight. Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him. For he was afraid to stay in Zoar, and he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. On the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Their firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, 
She also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Now this next incident, we see how Lot goes to the mountain that originally he didn't want to go to. That I guess he did go into Zoar, but afterwards he fled into the mountains. So why exactly did he go into the mountains? Where there's two different theories. One is the people of Zoar probably did not trust him after everything that happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. And then another one is he had no livelihood. In verse 31... It says, then the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of the earth. So why did they devise this plan? Because they had no men to marry them. Now, this is not to say that there was nobody left on the world to marry because that is not true. But the, the text is saying here is that they couldn't find a man who wanted to marry them. Why? Well, then again, here's another interesting thing to think about. They probably thought that marrying these two daughters would probably be very bad luck for them after what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. So they're probably like, forget this, we're not going to marry you. Even your sons-in-laws died. We're not going to do it. And that's probably the reason why they weren't able to get married. So in order to preserve the seed, they decided to commit this incestuous act with their father, they try to do what is somewhat, bring about somewhat of a good through a very corrupt means, and it has consequences. So we see here that sort of what is kind of like a birth of, rebirth of Sodom, I would say, in that cave, through this incestuous act. That this lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't just flee them when they left the city, but it followed Lot and his daughters out into the city and was reborn, was reconceived that night in that cave. I guess in many ways it's kind of like one of those horror films where like at the end they thought they got rid of that monster or demon, but because the protagonist was carrying like one of those little trinkets or something that they couldn't let go, that the demon actually came back at the end in the surprise ending, and then the movie just like ends just like that. I'm sure you've seen those movies before, right? Okay, I was a little kid, and I used to watch a lot of those movies back in the old days. But it's kind of like this in the sense that because they weren't willing to let go of Sodom and Gomorrah, it followed them. It followed them into the other city, and it was rebirthed once again. So what this whole passage is trying to show us is that the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah has caused even these believers to make really poor choices. That even though the writer does not openly condemn incest, just this whole connection between Sodom and this incestuous act puts this episode in a very bad light. So it's not supposed to be a good commentary, especially when we look at the next few verses in 37 and 38 that talks about the birth of these children who became Israel's enemies. Moab, a play on the word father. Lot was the father of Moab. And then Ammon, which means kinsman. That Ammon was the son of the nearest kinsman, Lot. Right now, these two nations, well, at the time of Israel, they were east of Israel. Today, we have Ammon, which is in northern Jordan, and Moab, which is central Jordan. That these two nations became the new point of concern, not Lot. It provides a glimpse into their origin and nature, where they came from, and why it is that they had so much conflict with Israel because of the poor choice of that believer at the time. So what is this lesson trying to show us? It's this, that we can be believers. We can truly be believers, but we can make these mistakes. We can sin in a way in which it affects our future generations if we are not careful. Why? Because it's not because the children are paying for our sins in the sense that they're going to be punished for the murder that we've done, but it's because of our evil influences that they're going to copy all the way down through the generations. 
I mean, think about it. Does a evil Kim Jong produce a good Kim Jong? It never happens that way because the, the son is always looking up to the father and they're so evil, they're going to be bloodthirsty for that same power and pride. That is why scripture is so emphatic on teaching your children the law of the Lord and passing down godly teaching and not being a hypocrite before them. Just in Exodus 20, 5 to 6, when it says, The Lord visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. These two chapters show the righteousness of God on display, the power of his righteousness to judge both the wicked as well as to preserve those who have been saved by faith, no matter how imperfect they are. There is an extreme danger of loving sin that it will have an effect on us if we are not careful, if we cannot let go of the city. So the whole point of this last closing with Lot and his daughters is that no good can come from loving a city so morally bankrupt that it awaits judgment. So that is why don't get caught up in a city or in a lifestyle if that's where you're at right now. That if you need to let go of something, let go of it. And don't let that cause you to make poor choices. Because Israel was constantly warned of the, follow, the folly of becoming too attached to Canaan. And in the same way, the church is warned of the danger of becoming too attached to the world, to the unbelieving world. Because even those choices that we make that are influenced by the world can indeed affect other people, such as our children. So if you see these patterns of unrighteousness going on in your life, maybe you're not saved, then I urge you to come to Christ, to believe in Christ today and get saved. Because this passage shows us a serious warning of what God will do in regards to sin one day. Because all sin will be judged. All sin will be judged. Steve Lawson says, Every sin in the history of the world would either be punished in hell or punished in Christ. That is why if you have Christ and you have a shield for your sins, that you are made righteous, that you no longer have to pay for your sins, that when it's relinquished, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. When we look at this passage, we have four categories of people. We have Abraham, the really devout Christian. Then we have Lot, the weak, struggling Christian. And then we have Lot's family who perished in Sodom and Gomorrah, which means they could be false believers. And then we have the actual Sodomites themselves, the wicked pagans. So what category are you in tonight? And depending on what category you're in tonight, I've told you, what you need to do to be made right with God. So make that choice right today with God. Let's pray. God, a very serious topic that we're looking at tonight, a very hefty topic with a lot of very sad but sobering themes. We ask, 